Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. I would like to thank the organizers, CNE News, as well as uh, the ACS Society for this honor. It's truly humbling to be up here and having listened all morning to just the wonderful work that's going on and the diversity of the work. Um, I hope to provide maybe a slightly different perspective than, uh, than some of the talks you've seen uh, earlier. What I wanted to talk about is we're doing a lot of fantastic chemistry. But eventually, this chemistry is going to need to have an application. And how do you figure out what the application is going to need and how that would affect your chemical research? So basically, can you solve the inverse problem? There's a target you're trying to go for. What's the design space you should be considering? And hopefully, if you can take anything away from this talk, that's kind of what we're going after. Um, but I wanted to start off with a little bit of background. I think I'm the only local. Uh, of the talented 12. I was born in DC. I grew up in the DC area. And so it, this is sort of a fun homecoming. Um, and I have a similar story to Michael. And I actually chose not to put it in this presentation. I feel pretty good about that now. Because I too saw The Rock um, and when I was in high school. And I thought, this is a really cool job. How do I get involved? And fortunately, my high school science teacher, Mrs. Walsh, uh, was able to get me an internship at the Army Research Lab in Adelphi, Maryland. Um, I didn't get to do Nicolas Cage type stuff. Uh, I got to do work with molecular aptamers uh, for environmental sensing, but I was hooked all the same. And I think the things that attracted me to chemistry and, and the chemical sciences in general, I think are the same things that attract many folks in this room here, which is the freedom to sort of decide what you want to do, the ability to challenge conventional wisdom, to do hypotheses, test them, uh, and see if you actually were correct. And of course, you know, the opportunity to really plot your own course. Um, and I'm fortunate uh, that when I went to undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania, graduate school at the University of Illinois, and did my postdoc at Argonne National Lab that I found fantastic mentors to help me along the way. Professor John Bowes at the University of, Illinois, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, excuse me. Uh, Professor Paul Kennis, the boss at uh, Illinois. And of course, uh, Jack Vahey at Argonne National Lab. And all of these mentors helped me sort of build my confidence and really you know, want to strike out and, and challenge myself to do uh, different types of work. But this title here is not 100% true. Um, this was not the only job I ever wanted. I, I harbored other dreams as well. Um, and at one point in time, I was certain that I would be a professional soccer player. Um, I managed to make it to college before I ran out of talent. Um, but in, 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 in my, my dreams, I would end up in a Champions League final such as this. Um, but it wasn't all for naught, and I think many folks here have uh, also participated in athletics. And you learn quite a lot from working in that environment. You learn humility. You develop a thick skin. I think you learn quite a lot about resilience. But what I took away from it primarily was teamwork and the critical need for teamwork, uh, to, to have teamwork for success. And the one way to think about it is that if you think about a soccer team, you have 11 people on one side of the ball on, and 11 people on the other side of the ball. They're trying to score a goal, and there's 11 people trying to disrupt them, right? And so the coordination that it needs to happen between all of the different people on the field is tremendous, right? And so if you can, I like to think about that as a good way to think about collaboration. But another way you can think about it is also systems that you'd want to design. If I want to build an electrochemical system, which I'll talk to you later, I need all of my members of my team, the components of the system, to work together in order for my system to produce the results that I'd like. And so I, I, I think that's a, a nice analogy, one that I, I try to follow. Um, and so with that, my group uh, focuses on uh, advancing the science and engineering of electrochemical technologies that, uh, may, that are needed for a sustainable energy economy. Um, very similar to some of the talks earlier, I, I think we have major challenges uh, in energy going forward. And chemistry is the key to um, unlocking uh, new methods of uh, converting and storing energy. And our research focuses on combining fundamental electrochemistry uh, cell design and prototyping, so actually building reactors and testing them to see how well the chemistry works. And then finally, techno-economic modeling, which I'll spend a lot of time talking about today. And this is sort of the who cares part of it. So if I have a fantastic uh, 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 you know, redox molecule, if I develop a great reactor, is this going to be good enough uh, to meet a target that's been set? And how do I then turn techno-economics on its head to say, well, what should I be looking for? What kind of systems could begin to hit these targets? And so. We, of course, focus on big problems. I believe a grand challenge uh, of coming up in, in the em emerging century is the fact that we're going to double our energy use uh, in the next 50 years. Uh, and we need to find a way to um, 
improve on what we have already. So the current modes are, are not going to be effective. And so we need to try to think about, well, what are other ways for us to improve the infrastructure that already exists and come up with new technologies to uh, allow uh, new ways of converting energy. And so when we think about grid energy storage, which is what I'd like to talk about today, uh, the purpose of grid energy storage is to improve the reliability of the grid and also to enable the incorporation of uh, new uh, sources of electricity. And so this is an example of a typical grid structure here where we have fossil generation that is then piped to residential and industrial end users. And it's just the supply and demand are, are intensely coupled to one another. So, you know, the, these are sort of following one another, the generation and the demand. If you integrate renewables in there, uh, renewables are non-dispatchable. You can't really control exactly when the sun is shining. You can't really control uh, when, the, when the wind is blowing or not. And oftentimes, when you have the highest amount of power being delivered, uh, you don't have the demand waiting for it. So having energy storage in place can begin to decouple this supply and demand, where I almost have a well that I can store uh, excess electrons that I can then deliver on demand later. So the way we typically do this on a very large scale is we use uh, pumped hydro. It's about 95% of the grid storage in the world. And that's as simple as just pumping water up and down a hill, right? Uh, it's very effective, it's very cheap, but it's also limited by geography and size. You know, you need a, a giant dam or you need to do some major geological engineering. And oftentimes this becomes a challenge. And so energy storage, especially electrochemical energy storage, has the potential to begin to meet some of these needs uh, in terms of its energy density um, and its ability to respond to the grid. Uh, we don't necessarily think about batteries in sort of the copper top that I've showed you here. Uh, we're very interested in redox flow batteries. Uh, redox flow batteries you can think of as a liquid chemical plant whereby I have my active species that are stored in a tank and are pumped to a reactor where they'll oxidize or reduce. There's two electrolytes there that are separated by a perm-selective membrane that allows ions to back, balance back and forth. And you get systems that are on the order of a container size. The nice thing about this particular system is that the tank size is the en defines the energy, and that is separate from the reactor size, which defines the power of the system. So you can scale very easily, and maintenance becomes a significantly easier task. And so talking with a, a chemical engineer such as myself, I look at this and I get excited. I mean, I, there's a lot of things here that I recognize from undergrad, and there's a lot of stuff we can do. So, cool idea. Why aren't we doing it right now? Um, two problems. One is we don't really know a whole lot about flow batteries. Uh, we only really, the modern flow battery was arguably invented in 1974, um, and really only people began to get quite interested around 2010 or so. And so you can see there's a, a large growth um, in interest Right? But just to kind of put this uh, in, in, in sort of some context, 300 publications a year is not a whole lot. Um, if you think, looked at fuel cells or you looked at lithium ion batteries, you're talking about one or two or orders of magnitude more publications. So there's a lot more known in those adjacent fields. Right? The second is that, as you might expect, the costs of these systems are significantly higher than where we'd want them to be. Right? The DOE has established a long-term target of about $150 per kilowatt hour, and most modern systems are on the order of $400 or $500 per kilowatt hour. So there's opportunities now for dramatic step changes through enhancements in redox chemistries. There's also improvements in reactor design, and so part of this talk is a recruiting pitch to those uh, chemists in the audience. Um, there's a lot of uh, red meat here. Come and get it. <laughs> and so. There's many different pathways uh, that people think about for next generation flow batteries, moving beyond what we have right now, moving from transition metal salts such as irons and vanadiums to organic molecules that can be tuned for redox potential, solubility, all sorts of other uh, aspects, uh, thinking about larger soluble polymers that can be then combined with uh, physical separators so that you can have no crossover, these species are, are completely blocked by size. Uh, moving from acidic aqueous supporting electrolytes that tend to be corrosive to uh, neutral pH type systems or even non-aqueous systems, which is an area of particular interest because you can have higher voltage windows, uh, which means a higher energy density. And then finally, improvements in cell design, moving from designs that are borrowed from adjacent technologies to designs that are actually specific to the chemistries that you're beginning to look at. But Looking at all of these options, if you think about yourself from various positions, if you're a student in the audience, you're saying, where, where would I start to work? If I'm a faculty member in the audience, I'm thinking, all right, you know, what is going to be the most successful approach here, and how do I map my skills to this particular need? And if I'm thinking about sponsoring some research in this area, I'm thinking, okay, how do I define success? 
Who's going to, you know, what's the best combination here? And so to this we turn to techno-economic modeling. Um, and the idea here is to connect a system level and performance goal now to some sort of desired set of materials level properties, right? The idea behind this would be typically if I know what my system desired price or performance is going to be, I mentioned $150 per kilowatt hour established from the DOE, can I do the inverse problem and back calculate what sorts of sets of materials properties I would need, what sort of cost parameters are, I would need, and what sort of component performances I would need. And this would give me then a design space with which I could then begin to look into what chemistries might begin to meet these goals. And so, like any good chemical engineer, I draw a box around my system uh, to design a control volume. Um, and I say, I establish some benchmarks. I say I want to look at future straight battery prices. This is assuming that all these batteries are made on the gigafactory level, so we're almost reaching economies of scale. I set a discharge time of five hours, which is about where most of the application space that we see exists. And I exclude inverter in installation costs, and I'm happy to talk to people afterwards as to why that is. And I can come up with an equation that gives me the price of the battery over the energy stored for that battery, which is a function of a reactor cost, a function of an electrolyte cost, as well as a function of the balance of plant and the additions to price. Balance of plant is all the other stuff you need for the battery to work. Pumps, heat exchangers, tanks, all of this type of stuff. And additions to price are labor, depreciation, uh, and profit margin, which is why it's a price rather than a cost, right? So these, this is a little bit of math here, and it's especially tough for such a short talk like this, but I wanted to give you an example of what these kind of equations can tell you. And so the example I'll give you is to say, uh, if I wanted to try to design a battery, um, and I wanted to figure out what the design space would be, I can plot cell voltage of my battery versus the area-specific resistance of my reactor, so basically how big my reactor needs to be. And I can plot contours of ISO concentration, right? So this is the concentration of a reactant that I would need in order to meet the target. And what you can see here is that this line that's shaded here in green, this is a viable region for a $100 per kilowatt hour battery in the non-aqueous design space. And so, for example, you can see things that as I get to higher cell voltages, I have less and less requirements for my, 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 my concentration. And as I get to systems that have lower and lower area-specific resistance, I get to have a little bit more design space for my active species, right? You can do the same sort of design for something like water, uh, so an aqueous-based system, and some interesting trends begin to pull out. First of all, it looks like the aqueous system is significantly less uh, sensitive to concentration. This is because water is dirt cheap, and so adding a more expensive material to water actually is not as effective as you might think. Um, and you can also see that water is then also quite insensitive to area-specific resistance as a flat part of the curve. And so really, if you're working in the aqueous space, cell voltage is an important thing for you to be considering. So from these types of maps, one can design materials level metrics and targets, right, for which now I can go and talk to my friends in the chemistry community and say, are these targets outrageous? You know, what kind of systems are actually going to work? And are there approaches that we can take um, that would allow us to begin to hit multiple aspects of this target? I think the important thing to take away from here, if you take anything from the high level, is that aqueous redox flow batteries are at a higher technology readiness level. You can buy some today. There are improvements that are still needed to get the cost down, but there's not as much design space to work on. For non-aqueous redox flow batteries, they're in their infancy. You know, we, there's so many things that we don't know. There's so many interesting scientific problems, and we're always looking to collaborate, again, thinking about this teamwork aspect. Um, and so to kind of give you some sense of a direction you could go now with this knowledge, this is an example of going from small organic molecules or ROMs, these are, think of them as a single unit, to now going to larger and larger redox active structures, going to a RAU, a redox active oligomer, to a RAP, a redox active polymer, all the way to a RAC, a redox active colloid. And as you get to these larger and larger structures, you, your, your, your requirements for separation become different. So for a very small molecule, I need an ion exchange membrane to sieve you know, the, the charge balancing ions from now the active species. But as I go to these larger systems, I can um, use nanofiltration and microfiltration type membranes to begin to block them. So there's an opportunity for having a no crossover type system. But can this be then balanced with the fact that I have a significantly larger molecule? And so the techno-economic modeling can be used to identify a sweet spot in this design space to say, well, my membrane's going to be expensive, so I'd like to get away from the ROM modality. But if I go to this RAU with a, a polymer with intrinsic microporosity, I get this sweet spot here, which allows me to get a low point, 
But as I go to larger and larger systems, my increasing molecular weight means that I actually have a more and more expensive system because I have to buy more material to actually make my battery work. It's more, you know, a mole, from moles of electron from, to moles of grams. And so from that knowledge, we can then begin to design uh, systems uh, that encompassing, these are dimers here. This is a model system with a tempo and a biologen. We can combine that with a uh, polymer with intrinsic microporosity, which we collaborate with uh, folks at uh, Berkeley on. And we can build systems that, in principle, should be zero crossover. Uh, and so right here, what you see now is uh, the, the efficiency of the battery. And then on the bottom there, what you'll see is the theoretical char the charge and discharge versus the theoretical line. So what you'll notice here is that the battery isn't lasting as long as we'd like it to. We need to go back and design, and this is where the chemistry comes in. So is maybe these two species are not quite far enough apart from one another. One is about a little bit greater than one nanometer, and one is a little, the pore is a little bit less than 0.9 nanometers. You know, maybe we need a bigger separation. But this is how the chemistry comes in. This is how we can begin to understand and design radically different batteries based upon this techno-economic modeling. So I've taken a lot of my time, but I wanted to take the opportunity to thank all of the people uh, who made this possible, uh, particularly the folks in my group who are highlighted in red, and our myriad of collaborators, again, thinking about the theme of teamwork and everybody working together. You know, we work with some excellent chemists, some excellent engineers, uh, and without them and the funding below, this uh, work would not be possible. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions anyone may have. Thank you.